I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Lost Tribe of Clinical Data, A Dramatic Story Based on Real-Life Events. My name is Samantha Holvey, and I'm the Director of Community and Education at WEEDI. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And before we get started, I want to take a moment to go over just a few administrative details. As you have noticed upon joining the webinar, everyone has been placed on mute for the presentation. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. In your GoToMeeting control panel, you will see a questions box. Please type your questions or comments into the field and hit enter. You will also see a handouts box, and the slide template or the slide deck has already been uploaded, so you can go ahead and download the slides. I know everybody's always very concerned about getting the slide deck, so it is already available for you to download if you would like to. Um, we'll also be emailing everyone the link to download the recording of the webinar as well as the slide deck. So any further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's speakers. You can go to the next slide, please. We have John Kelly, Principal Business Advisor, and Sergio Rada, Senior Director of Product Management. Both of these gentlemen are from edifex, and I'm looking forward to uh, what they have to teach us today. So, John, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Sam. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day uh, to uh, spend a little bit with us, and uh, hopefully you'll find what we have to present interesting. Um, we're going to cover a little bit about uh, this idea we're calling in a humorously the lost tribe. Uh, some of the drivers that are uh, that we're seeing uh, our customers, uh, many of whom are payers, uh, looking to to access, acquire, connect with their network around clinical data. Uh, some of the key factors to consider when you are looking at how to engage with your network uh, around the idea of clinical data exchange, uh, and then uh, we'll talk about some smart approaches. Uh, to either ramping up your existing clinical data interactions or starting from scratch and really trying to reach out and take advantage of the emerging uh, set of clinical data that's becoming available as a result of so many providers adopting electronic uh, health records. Uh, and then, you know, kind of we'll talk a little bit about how do you design success no matter what approach you take and no matter how you're going. Then we'll provide some time for some questions. Next slide, Sergio. So if you'll bear with us, uh, you know, give us a little latitude here, you know, kind of invoking a very old metaphor of the lost tribe, relating that to the idea of clinical data um, and, and thinking about uh, clinical data as it's been discussed that we see our customers, a lot of the industry, the folks that we're talking to, talking about clinical data as uh, something separate, unique, different, uh, that requires a whole new type of IP, a whole new type of infrastructure and architecture, and, and really something other than what you've been doing uh, historically um, to exchange data between payers and providers. Um, our, our view of, of clinical data, in a sense, is that it's really all patient data, you know, whether it's data that you've acquired from claims, prior auth, referrals, all of the different HIPAA type transactions, X12, labs, NCPDP, uh, you know, that it, HL7 fired the new emerging standards and what we call clinical data is really just a different format. It's still all about the patient. A patient sees a doctor. And so the idea that, you know, we all used to be one, that there's a group, uh, you know, each with its different flavors, there's something special, you know, there are some idiosyncrasies about lab data or about EHR data and HL7 and fire. But in reality, uh, they're all kind of tribes within a large clan. And that at a kind of point in time long ago, uh, you know, one type of this data, one tribe kind of split off and that we're now at a point where we're trying to capture that bit back in, that we've lost some important meaning and we're trying to bring it back into the whole. So we kind of, you know, used a, a playful metaphor, though, to try to get across a serious concept. Next slide, Sergio. So in our view, looking at you know, stepping back from what we see today and, and, and how the market has evolved, um, you know, the idea of the third party really began a separation. When you think of going back 
to you know the early days of modern medical care in the early 20th century doctor saw a patient they discussed shared a lot of information among two people and then all of that information was contained in that relationship and that then the doctor said okay you know this is what i'm going to charge you and the patient paid the doctor and so you know everything was together everything was a whole you know, the minute we introduce the notion of a third party, an insurance company or some other entity paying for the care, we effectively split the data streams in healthcare. We had one set of data that was being accumulated specifically for reimbursement, and we had another set of data that we now call clinical data that was being accumulated specifically for the delivery of the care and supporting the physicians and the patients and actually, you know, treating illness and getting better. And, and, and over time, that became very regimented, very rigid. We had a complete, you know, one administrative data stream that became automated and digitized and formatted and, and, and development of standards, and then a completely separate data stream that was being stored initially on paper, and then slowly over time moved into the computerized patient record, which we now call the EHR, the EMR, uh, you know, the connected patient record. Where Whatever, whatever term you want to use for it. But, you know, to a great degree, when we started looking at the patients and we started kind of mashing up the responsibilities for who's taking care of the patient, who's managing the care, who's ensuring quality, suddenly different people weren't looking at the patient as a whole. They weren't looking at the full picture, you know, and, and, and more and more, the most important data that was necessary for people to do their jobs, whether they were on the provider or the payer side, was on another side of the fence. Providers didn't have access to the full range of claims and remittance and prior authorization data that the payers had. And, and, and more importantly, when payers are trying to begin to incent providers and share risk, they don't have access to the labs and the CCDAs and the fire and the data that was stored in the clinical record. So in the NFX view, the differences between clinical, what we call clinical information, we call administrative or financial information, is not so much in the nature of the information itself or what it's describing. It's about a patient seeing a doctor or an interaction between a patient and the health system. But it's just more about where, how was the information captured and where was it stored? And, and, and that's really what differentiates. There's no real difference in in the content itself, in, in the nature of the information. It's really all about the patient. Next slide, Sergio. So, you know, I think we've seen a lot of evolution in the last 10 years of the deployment of EHRs and meaningful use and all kinds of investment by the government. Probably maybe over a hundred billion dollars has been invested in, in the deployment of, of digital patient information uh, in the last 10 to 12, 13 years. Um, and largely, payers have sat on the sidelines. The development of the HIEs, some payers are taken advantage of, but largely it's more been, been more about uh, doctors communicating with doctors. And that's what the development, the evolution of the patients, even among the HL7 community. You know, there were, when high tech first started, there were four use cases, very much of it involved in Medicare's view of what the future value based payment would be about, but most of the investment was dealing with doctor to doctor, doctor to patient, uh, and, and continuity of care and connected care case studies, they really weren't looking at, well, what about that value-based stuff? What about the payment stuff? And, and, and the lack of trust between the communities was a, another barrier to sharing information about the patient. So even though we were working on all the technical stuff, the business cases and the trust factors and the contracting really wasn't in place. Well, here we are in 2018, you know, coming up in 2019, and suddenly the incentives, you know, ratcheted up by, by, by CMS and MACRA and things like that, the pressures that have never gone away around the cost and the quality of healthcare, suddenly there's such a huge demand that, you know, NFX is a company largely dealing with uh, payer customers, and our, our payer customers are coming to us constantly over the last, uh, say, 12 to 18 months and saying, okay, it's time. It's time for us to jump in. And, and, and so what's driving that is we see, you know, there's the, the claims attachments and prioritization stuff has always been there, but that the cost pressures and the utilization and the control and the risk pressures have pressed that up. But also HEDIS and STARS measures, you know, HEDIS measures are critical in terms of all of the payers that have gone into Medi uh, Medicare Advantage uh, and manage Medicaid, 
you know, they get paid based on an accurate representation of the illness of the patient population. And what payers have found is that largely they don't have, they're missing data. That in the coding process, in the sharing process, in the submission of just claims to get paid, there's a lot of diagnoses that don't get reported that would actually increase the revenue to the payers, the premium they would get to adequately cover the cost of the care. And the star measures in terms of competing in the marketplace for quality, you know, having all of the information both from the, that was captured in the EHR as well as the revenue cycle systems, having and creating that big picture can have a huge effect on the star rating of a plan. So, you know, the, the acquiring of this clinical information uh, directly hits, uh, you know, bottom line revenue through the HEDIS measures and top line growth when the payers are competing in the marketplace. And then, you know, this ties directly into risk adjustment scoring as, you know, even out of the, the, the public sector plans in terms of looking at how sick is the population, how can I at most competitively rate the cost of a care in terms of taking on insurance risk, how can I share risk with providers accurately and, and actually give them a good picture, entice providers to share in risk because I'm giving them great information in terms of their ability to bet that they can take good care of these patients and still you know, make a, a healthy margin to keep to keep alive as a, as a, as a as a provider entity, and so the whole idea of risk scoring, you know, is another thing. And then just again getting into the ACL quality measures, being able to compete, being able to just meet your basic compliance uh, uh, requirements with the public sector programs around ACOs and manage Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and then being able to actually affect the quality of the care to share information with the provider network because providers, payers are looking at a large horizontal sample of patients. They, they can take a very big picture view that can then feed that information back to specific providers about specific patients so they can say, hey, did you know this about your patient? Maybe there's something you can do and here's a suggestion. So these are the drivers that are finally causing the payers to say, you know what, let me look at the HIEs. Let me look at these private sources of information. Let me go directly to the EHR vendor let me find out how I can get at this information that people have been actively talking about for the last five years. So we see this happening. We see them jumping into the game and we see a lot of our, our, our customers coming to us and saying, OK, what do I need to know? What should I know? And so we're trying to you know, gather as much information across the industry and feed that back to you. And that's the source of, of what the messaging is we're trying, to, we're trying to share today. Next slide, Sergio. So, you know, before you jump into it, some important observations that, that we've been able to make in talking to customers in the community and to providers and some of the standards organizations that we work with. Um, you know, there's kind of three dimensions that we see that drive successful activity or investments by payers. You know, um, one obviously is willingness. You know, we've heard a lot. Uh, and I've been in meetings literally with providers and payers where the providers are telling me those payers, they don't want to share information. And then those same payers in that same room with those same providers telling me those providers, they don't want to share information. So there's still a big willingness conversation that has to take place and some barriers that have to be brought down. And those are, you know, cultural, social, economic. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into that. But that's not really so much about investment of money or in technology. That's really more about uh, investing in relationships. And so there's, you know, that's something though, investing in relationships is something that can be controlled by the payers and the providers when they have other incentives at play. And that comes into the other two dimensions of, of, of success here. You know, there are, if, if providers are operating with, you know, a more recent version of one of the more sophisticated EHRs, you know, the, the Cerners, the Epics, the Allscripts of the world, the other usual suspects, um, they have pretty decent capability. Now they have to go a little bit beyond the EHR. They have to have some, what I'll call gateway capability. They have to have some connectivity. They have to have account management. So they need some, some fairly decent infrastructure in place to actually be able to carry out efficient, uh, scalable, uh, high volume, high speed information exchange with the provider, with their payer networks and partners and with the payers with the provider network. So capability is certainly, you know, uh, something that's important. But sometimes what's more important than anything else is what's the value? You know, if a particular payer, how many patients does a particular payer share with a particular provider? Because the volume and the types of patient, that case mix, 
that those two entities, the payer and the provider, they have a set of shared customers. If there's a very large base of shared customers, now there's a lot of opportunity to think about value. And the other thing that's important is maybe we share a lot of customers, but how much can the provider actually control? I think one of the observations we made, and you know, it's a little bit controversial on both sides, but you know, it, it, in, in my view at least, uh, value-based care really only works when providers are given healthy incentives to do a good job at the things that they actually can control. And at the same time, though, they're held harmless for things they can't control. And if you think about a large IDS that may be covering a million members, you know, they are more like an insurance company. They can take actuarial risk that, you know, I'm going to win some, I'm going to lose some, but hopefully I'm just going to net out. But when you're trying to share risk with a, a provider who may only, you may only share a thousand or 2,000 or 5,000 or 20,000 patients with, you know, there's a lot of random events, you know, uh, uh, some random neonatal, five or six neonatal babies or some high cost cancer cases in that population. And then suddenly for things that are completely out of the control of the provider, a parent may be trying to uh, share risk with them. And so it doesn't really work because the provider is being held accountable for things they can't control. And the, for the things that they can control, if you think about a provider that does a lot of joint therapy replacement, right? A joint therapy replacement proven, and this is recent data right from CMS, is I think in the last six weeks or so, that there were huge savings in the small community of mandated joint replacement bundle payment contracts. And the reason is, is because once they were mandated, those providers were able to control the end-to-end -end cycle. They were able to, the hospital was able to reach out to the pre-acute and post-acute providers, get a contract together, follow the patient from their first encounter through to their therapy and getting them back to work as early as possible, for example. And, and so that's something they control. They can actually give good care for that continuity and bundle. And so providers were able to actually put into place things that improve the quality, the value, the efficiency of the care. And then they were able to make money on their contract with the government. And so that capability of looking at the population that you're sharing with the insurer between the insurer and the provider and then being able to say, okay, what parts of the care can I control? What can I do? What can I measure? What can I provide value for? In many ways, and can you go to the next slide, Sergio? In many ways, that really is, is where you should be focusing. When you start to initiate your information exchange with your network, you know, the upper right quadrant, if they're highly willing, they're highly capable, and there's a lot of value, you're probably already doing information sharing with between those payers and providers. You know, even if you're doing it in a proprietary way, you're reaching out and going, hey, we share a lot of opportunity here. You send me an Excel file. You send me uh, a big access data dump. You send me a common delimited CSV file. You're already doing that. But where the real opportunity is, if the provider has high capability, and there's a high value opportunity that the payer and the provider can share around that common customer, then now you're just talking about willingness. Now you're just sitting down at the table and say, hey, maybe we don't like each other. <laughs> maybe we aren't comfortable sharing data. Maybe we think we're adversaries, but let's put that all aside because you've got a lot of capability, Mr. Provider, and I have a lot of value that I can gain share with you and give you a big upside. So that this is something to consider, not just from the technology perspective of what you should be investing in, but thinking about your market, go after that, that high margin, high value business. And those are the providers you should be reaching out to in order basically to get a fast return on investment for what we're going to be talking to you about what we think you should be investing in, in terms of the kind of infrastructure you need. Hope that makes sense to y'all. Next slide. So the, the other thing to consider here, too, is when you're looking at, and Sergio is going to go into a little bit about what we think are some of the aspects, characteristics, dimensions of the, the technology infrastructure you should be looking at if you want to go down this road. Um, you know, there's been a, a fairly significant evolution in the types of containers, I'll call them, documents, uh, methods that are being used for priors and providers to share information. You know, going back, obviously, into the 80s, we had paper charts. And so the real method to share was, you know, short of making a copy and physically sending it, but faxing, creating PDFs, sharing that information really as an image document. Um, you know, then we, you know, HL7, going back 50 years, HL7 
was in a lot of hospital systems in terms of being able to share information between the lab system and the and the registration system or the lab system and, and the radiology system. So HL7 has been around that version two EDI capability has been around a long time and it was heavily leveraged in the early days of high tech and meaningful use and the standards heavily relied on, on the version two uh, cycle of, of HL7. You know, fast forward, a lot of the gaps that existed in those prior methods were worked on in version three and CDA and CCDA and now FHIR. You know, we've advanced quite a bit in terms of our capability to move from document-based exchange to actually data element-based exchange, which is what you see in FHIR. You know, the, the idea is rather than give me a CCDA, give me a patient dump of a whole lot of information when the payer only needs a couple of little data elements with FHIR. Uh, the, the payer is essentially able to ask for, give me those blood pressures, give me those A1C values, and then the fire standard can respond. Well, this is all well and good, but you know that's not where the industry is now. In large, in many situations, you might have providers who are capable and willing, and there's a lot of value, but they're still going to be able to give you documents in, in PDF images or in the HL7 version 2 standards. And so whatever you're looking at, you know, you have to be flexible enough to enter these arrangements with your providers to say, you know, what kind of document can I handle? And just like your cell phone can handle MP3s or, you know, Apple music files or PDFs or three different versions of video files and, you know, essentially whatever document someone wants to send to you attached to an email, your phone can open it, right? So you want to think about being able to have that same kind of relationship with your provider network that however they can send you this, you can find value in it and you've got the tooling to be able to open it up and be able to deal with it without having to implement another whole entire stack of infrastructure, which is what we see a lot in the marketplace right now. Someone wants to solve their HEDIS problem. They go to a vendor and they employ an entire stack, top to bottom, vertical, that has everything part as part of it, as opposed to saying, you know what, I'm already exchanging information. Why don't I leverage that same exchange network and then just focus on what I need to be able to do to read the document, interpret the document, and do something with the information. Next slide. So I think the last factor in terms of looking at, you know, implementing some kind of architecture capability or portfolio of, of software that you need to do in order to do clinical information is think about that flexibility around the document and the flexibility around what you have to support in terms of volume. You know, if you go down this road with these providers, you're going to start with, you know, so many gigabytes of data, it's soon going to be terabytes of data. And that's going to be gigabytes and zigabytes and terabytes of data. So making sure that you're planning for that going forward, because whereas in the administrative side of the house with the HIPAA extal transactions, it's a very defined small amount of data that you have to exchange. You might exchange 50 million claims a year, but when you think about memory and storage and bandwidth, it's still relatively small compared to a lot of other information. When you think about going into the amount of data that's generated by patients in these EHRs, you're talking about uh, you know, orders of magnitude difference in terms of the volume and the bandwidth that you're gonna need in the memory in these machines. So you know, whatever you do, it's not buy for tomorrow, but at least plan for tomorrow. And I think, again, I talked a little bit about the variety of the data that you've got to plan for. You don't want to have a separate information and technology stack for every different type of document you're bringing in. And then just the speed, you know, how fast can you get the data from the point of service to someone who can actually do something, whether it's a UM team, your CM team, you know, the, the data warehouse folks internally. How can you add the value that a payer has in terms of the 100,000 foot uh, view of the world and then be able to? Uh, do something with the data and quickly get it back. So whether it's clinical alerts, whether it's interventions, whether it's observations on the population, whether it's feedback to the provider about how they're doing under their contract so that I'm not waiting to half a year or full year and go, oh, wow, I did a really terrible job last year and now I'm going to take a financial hit. No, you want to be able to tell them they by day, week by week, month by month, hey, here's how you're doing against your contract. Based on the claims and clinical information I'm bringing in, here's a dashboard that says, you, Mr. Provider, here's your scorecard of how you're doing. So that before you get to the end of the year, you can say, wow, maybe I can do this differently, and that's going to put me back on track, and next week's dashboard is going to have me in the green instead of the red. So that kind of velocity is critical about the kind of infrastructure that you want to implement. So next slide. And with that, I believe I'm going to turn it over to Sergio to talk a little bit about more about what this 
this infrastructure that we're describing looks like and how you might go down that road. Thank you, John. So let me talk now about the solutions and um, talking to our customers, spare customers, uh, I would say we've encountered uh, two kind of extremes of how payers are approaching solutioning the problems that John has um, talked about before. So one is what we call use case driven and I'll give you like an example. Um, let's say a payer wants to implement uh, claims attachments or prioritization attachments. So um, they will kind of focus on this specific use case and then they will go back to their provider network. They will identify who the providers they want to work with for this specific use case. Uh, wherever they can, they will leverage existing connectivity or if needed, they will uh, augment the connectivity to be able to solve this specific use case. And then, uh, uh, of course, they will, once they get the data, they will decide, okay, for this use case, I'll probably store in this system or that system, maybe in case of claims management, uh, sorry, claims attachments, they will probably store it in some document management system that they may already have or purchased. And then uh, later on, as a, like an afterthought, they may think, okay, so we, we have this data, so, you know, maybe some other departments need it, so they will kind of start thinking how can they share that document management system or how they can you know disseminate that information to other departments on a need basis or on some more um, structured way so that's kind of one uh, way how uh, our payer customers are approaching the problem is we call it use case driven when they have a specific use case and they start solving the specific problem the other uh, extreme um, of the spectrum what we've seen is um, uh, a few customers have approached us and uh, asking <clears throat> about a holistic approach. Um, so, and what that means is uh, uh, they probably have gone back and they've determined uh, what are uh, across all their departments, what are the needs for the clinical information is there. And then uh, they want to, um, and some already are kind of in the process of implementing some of the aspects of it is how to uniformly request this information from the uh, providers and they're also thinking about you know the fatigue uh, from the provider perspective so that they don't ask the providers again and again for the same information so uh, and then um, um, where do they store all this in a, some kind of a common store or uh, uh, common way of storing this data and how do they disseminate this information to different uh, uh, departments that require that information. So very, I would say, different approaches uh, to solve this problem. And uh, we've seen a few that uh, are looking to do some kind of a hybrid approach where um, they start with some specific use cases, but as they solve those use cases, they uh, look at, they always look at the big picture and as they design the solution for the specific use cases, they uh, try to design in such a way so that as new use cases come in, they all kind of fall into place and it's not disparate systems, there is not different silos of data, it's all kind of fall into place. To So as they implement all the use cases in the end, they will get to this holistic uh, approach. And um, if I were to compare these different approaches, there is of course pros and cons for each approach. And um, if I were to look at the use case driven approach, of course, there is a lot of pros. Uh, there is usually a very defined approved uh, budget. There is a very defined uh, clear owner uh, of that kind of project. The requirements are very clear from uh, get go. Uh, and all the inputs, outputs and uh, the processing uh, requirements, everything is very clear. So uh, having all this up front, of course, uh, is a big boost to get the project started quickly and implement it in a relatively short period of time. Of course, the cons is, uh, is very narrow scope of the of the use case because only that use case has been solved. That is, of course, the problem with the provider dissatisfaction because as more use cases have been built out, different departments are asking maybe for the same uh, information multiple times because these are all silos. Uh, there is no coordination between departments. And um, each use case, you know, takes um, kind of a certain amount of time, money to uh, to build to uh, to solution. And as you add more use cases, you quickly will realize that you know overall the cost is actually much higher than if you were to go with the strategic approach. 
And the strategic approach, uh, information exchange, uh, the pros are very clear. You know, it's a very scalable model. Um, there is one store where everything is stored, um, and um, it, it positions the organization very well to, for data reuse. Um, and um, for all kind of different uh, dip, um, usage of that data, of course, for the admin side, the risk management, population health, all those different things that John uh, mentioned before. However, it, it comes with uh, some, I would say, cons or drawbacks. So first of all, um, uh, we are talking about here is multiple departments uh, being involved here. So there is no clear uh, leader or owner of this. So it requires a support from executive leadership um, there is, usually the leader or uh, the owner is I most time most of the time in this kind of solution is the IT that needs to coordinate between various stakeholders and uh, this whole coordination is of course not that easy and sometimes it's uh, time consuming and also um, uh, it requires a lot of consensus a lot of discussions between different stakeholders to get to the right solution um, to for making this request and to, for acquiring all this clinical information. Um, in the hybrid approach, um, the pros are uh, the fact that uh, we are benefit, benefiting from the use case approach. I mean, again, we have very clear defined uh, requirements, ins and outs uh, defined for each uh, use case. Um, there is very clear ROI uh, for generating long-term value because uh, as the use cases have been solved, it's a very clear defined way to uh, calculate the return on investment, to calculate the value of that, uh, solving that use case. And um, the hybrid approach also is uh, scalable because it provides ability to extend the solution to solve additional use cases in the future. The cons of the hybrid approach is um, initially takes longer to implement um, because some of the infrastructure items need to be put in place uh, sometimes in the, in the first uh, use case, as you saw the first use case, uh, it may require, because of that, it may require additional budget. And sometimes um, as you go along, uh, as you implement the second, third, fourth use case, then it requires coalition between multiple stakeholders. So this is all um, uh, nice, but as the Payers implement or think about implementing the solution, they also have to think, like John mentioned, they have to think about the providers or the partners where they get the data. And uh, uh, like John mentioned, there is the capability matrix, and we try to kind of uh, categorize them into like no tech, low tech, and high tech partners. And the whatever solution the payers are building, it has to meet, be able to meet the providers, the partners where they are. So if it's a no tech, uh, partner, they should be able to have portals, web-based uh, solution, um, print drivers to be able to easily allow uh, providers to print that data directly to the pair, uh, a lot of uh, web automation, workflows um, to help uh, those providers that uh, have no tech at all. For the low-tech uh, providers, they should uh, allow um, exchange of the information using uh, some kind of a like direct email protocols or SFTP or some kind of a managed file transfer uh, protocols to allow those providers to exchange information. And for the high tech providers that uh, understand uh, and can uh, support new emerging standards such as Fire or Blue Button uh, that already um, have integrated with multiple HAEs, um, for those providers also, you know, payers have to have appropriate infrastructure to be able to meet them and be able to take advantage of uh, these um, capabilities from the provider community. Another aspect as the uh, payers design and look at the solution is uh, to break down the problem, the big problem to manageable pieces. Uh, as you know, there is a saying, you know, how to eat an elephant? And the answer is, you know, one piece at a time. So instead of trying to swallow the uh, big elephant in the room, um, Payers have to think about how to decompose the big problem to smaller manageable pieces. Um, and we think uh, from if you were to look at the overall picture, uh, there is the abilities or features around getting the data, then integrating that data and, uh, and then uh, 
processing the data in some shape or form and then vending the data to different departments. And um, uh, when it comes to getting the data, of course, uh, it matters what the, where are the providers, what are the maturity uh, capabilities for those providers, what the established connectivity models uh, exist or what new connectivity models need to be put in place. And of course, the mutual agreement, the willingness, uh, like uh, John mentioned. Uh, on data integration, um, of course, players have to look at the supply chain mechanics, uh, what kind of... Um, uh, data they get from the providers, what quality, what do they need to validate that, that data, uh, perform integrity checks, uh, and also, of course, do the channel control, maybe educate the provider community to be able to, over time, to get much better data, uh, quality data. Um, of course, there is need to be put uh, some governance in place to do the information exchange, and also, of course, they need to be aligned on the semantics of the data. Um, as you know, on the clinical world, um, you know, HL7, one HL7 is one HL7. I mean, um, uh, there is disparity between, you know, code sets, nor terminology used. So. Uh, I, it, it's important to be able to upfront establish what the the data means that the data being exchanged between providers and payers. Uh, what does it really mean? Um, when we talk about data processing, uh, of course, it's important at that point to be able to organize all that data, correlate that data usually around the member or the episode of care, and then the ability to derive more insight out of data and uh, uh, augment that data to create more value for that data. And then. Uh, um, once these steps are done, then uh, uh, then it's important to be able to report on that data, to uh, create some kind of dashboards, to uh, get insights from that data. Um, you need to have some kind of capabilities to be able to look at the data and derive some kind of uh, uh, actionable insights and uh, proactive notifications uh, or uh, inform uh, the providers of some important things that are related to Care. So that's where the uh, timeliness of the data is important. And of course, at the end of the day is auditing of uh, all this entire mechanism. So be able to audit exactly where the data came from, how it was enriched, um, all the consents, consents in place and uh, how the data was disseminated, where it went to. So all this is of course important. So as the payers are designing this solution, it's very important to keep the big picture in mind. So even if, uh, uh, you start with building a specific use case. It's very important to be able to always keep in mind what, what is the end goal or what is the end architecture that eventually the payers will need to get there. And it's my belief actually that uh, in time uh, payers will get here, uh, whether we, they get uh, one approach of, you know, they start with just use case driven approach or um, they start initially with the strategic thinking because over time market forces will force um, the players to get to some kind of uh, optimization of their architecture. So um, on this diagram, uh, data of course starts from the end left side where the pro partners, providers, labs and so on, these are different sources of the data. And it's important to have a, uh, one unified enterprise gateway so that, uh, like I mentioned, the governance of the data exchange is in place the audit of that data, uh, where it came from and so on. So uh, to get some uh, consistent processing for that data. So Enterprise Gateway is an important aspect uh, of the solution. And then the Enterprise Gateway should, of course, be able to get uh, or able to process both structured and unstructured data. When I talk about unstructured, it's all the PDFs, images and so on, whether it's coming from claims attachments or it's coming from labs, so it's coming uh, all the different ways. Um, for the unstructured data, of course, data most likely or uh, needs to be stored some kind of enterprise content management system. But for structured data, um, payers need some kind of a, a holistic you know, enterprise data information uh, um, architecture to be able to store the data in a kind of a uniform way, to be able to access that data in a uniform way, to be able to process the data in a uniform way. Um, of course, uh, having both structured and unstructured information um, having some kind of uh, natural language processing or intelligent data extraction capabilities is key because the more the, 
structured information you have, the more actionable insights you can get out of the data, more value you can derive out of data. Uh, the, the more you have just in, uh, data in some kind of PDFs or unstructured info, uh, formats, the less value you can derive from that data. Uh, fewer use cases can be used, uh, can, can leverage that data. And having that unified enterprise data information, uh, if it's stored in a, some kind of a unified way, then you can apply, um, no, um, you, you can have then different modules that can work on that data in kind of uniform way. So at the bottom, you see different uh, modules that we, we believe are important. And over time, you may get all of them, but you know, to start, maybe you can start with some. Uh, so one important thing is like medical concepts normalization, De being, being able to uh, transform different concepts, let's say from SNOMED to LOING to uh, ICD uh, code sets. Uh, enterprise master person index is important because at the end of the day, uh, all that data needs to be correlated around uh, a member, a provider, uh, to be able to uh, derive insights. And of course, once the data is correlated around the member provider, um, you need to be able to build some kind of integrated patient record so that the, uh, this information can be more easily disseminated to the uh, destination systems. Um, if you apply some kind of a machine learning or pattern detection, uh, it's very important to be able to lower the cost of your uh, uh, intervention uh, or um, um, be able to do a meaningful uh, fraud detection. There's a lot of use cases around uh, uh, where the machine learning can really help. Having, of course, a correlation engine is important. And then if data is stored in one place, then um, uh, it also helps to more easily do enterprise analytics, be able to get insights from all that data. And of course, all that data needs to be able to be catalogized, uh, uh, indexed, so that a search engine can be put in place. So can somebody needs to look for information on uh, John Smith, uh, they should be able to get that information quickly, whether it's structured or unstructured. And uh, you need some kind of data integration services so to be able to transform that data into the destination format, whether you needed to disseminate that data to portals for your uh, no-tech um, customers, or maybe to your internal business applications, or even share with external entities based on um, the need that you may have. So it's very important to have this keep uh, keep this big picture in mind, even if you start designing a solution from specific use case. Um, another important aspect of the solutioning is, of course, uh, you always have to think about value. And at each step of the way, uh, just keep delivering value because that is a key success uh, for the solution um, um, to be able to get this solution on a fast footing and to get success out of this initiative. And um, that um, involves, like I said, um, first of all, you need to be able to properly acquire that data, correlate that data, whether it's from disparate systems, uh, different sources, uh, whether it involves different uh, protocols, uh, ranging from no tech to high tech uh, partners, uh, being able to reconcile all that data and uh, and reach that data, uh, whether it comes from claims or from HL7, from FHIR, uh, it all has to come uh, together. Um, so once you acquire, acquire and correlate the data, then the next step, of course, is to improve your uh, workflows, whether it's uh, your internal uh, workflows or external workflows. And uh, of course, um, once you have that data, like uh, I mentioned before, there is a huge opportunities to uh, derive more value by getting what's called notifications or triggers. So getting insight from that data um, to be able to intervene at the right step in the care based on the timeliness of the data, the early detection of different problems with the your uh, patient population, um, and uh, or let's say early detection of patient behaviors is another uh, thing that can be leveraged by having the proper data at the right time. So with that, I want to turn on back to John. Well, thank you, Sergey. I'm sorry. I uh, I put myself on mute to be respectful and forgot. Uh, so anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you for that summary of 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 our view of uh, you know and our learnings about what are the components that we think uh, need to be part of any any payers uh, uh, you know implementation of of clinical record 
exchange with their network. Um, I think, Sergio, you had mentioned you, you, there was one little box on the bottom that you called the integrated patient record, and I just want to spend a minute to expand on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that I'm sure everybody on, that, that is listening on this call have talked to this notion of the integrated patient record, the longitudinal patient record, the connected patient record, you know, and, and to a great degree, there's value in a lot of the nuances that that folks have talked to you about on, on that idea. But in many ways, when you look at uh, the various incantations or incarnations of that, um, and you see a, a screen that says, okay, here's, here's a representation of the patient's history, the longitudinal medical record. Um, when we talk about the integrated patient record, um, and this is, you know, a little bit of a bias from, you know, we're, we, we historically for 20 years have been at really at the, at the transaction, what I'll call the message level. And so our idea of the patient record is before it's been interpreted, before it's been analyzed, before it's been, you know, refined and aggregated and pushed into a data model, there's a concept we have that every message that comes in about your customer or your patient, your member, whether it's a X12 message, NCPDP message, HL7 message, you know, fire message, uh, whatever, each message has a source context, where it came from, who wrote it, how it got created. Um, and, and having an early in the process capability to just assimilate those messages without any interpretation, almost what I'll call in the raw form, and being able to correlate those, all the, you know, in a sense, the tribes, the various tribes within the clan, pull them all together and create a picture of your member, your customer, with all those messages in a line before they've been interpreted and pushed into a data model downstream in the data warehouse or the care management system or wherever, being able to have a snapshot at a point in time and being able to look back at that and change your view on that and modify that, we believe that's really critical. You know, no matter whose product you're using, having a staging area that allows you to pull all of the messages, all of the content that you've gotten from all of the people touching your customer in one place, get it correlated and organized and prepared for downstream use. In a sense, it means no matter how you change your internal systems, you can always go back to the original message. You're not going back to a second, third, or fourth hand account. It's the telephone game. I got a, I got a, I got a result in, or I got a visit summary, and then I've modeled it, and I put it in one system, and then I put it in the data warehouse, and I push it out to another system. It's a game of telephone. Being able to know what the original source was, where it came from, being able to correlate and having what, what I like to call a journal, a longitudinal journal of the interactions and the transactions that you have recorded over time about one of your customers. Having that repository, we believe, is really critical because it gives you much more flexibility as you evolve over time, over one year, two years, three years, five years, having your picture of that patient, you know, where's the rest of me? As that cute little cartoon we had earlier, having that total view is critical. And, and, and kind of where we're coming at this from is if you, no matter where you are on the continuum, whether you're doing the use case approach or the strategic clinical data exchange approach, you know, this is a picture that kind of a cartoon of what Sergio just presented. And, you know, again, a little bit of bias here, but this may look familiar. This is characterized and labeled within the context of clinical data exchange, but it's probably going to look a lot like the architecture you have for your HIPAA transactions right now. So, you know, our notion is where you've got a working network of communication between your payers and your providers, you know, where I would argue that you already got a, a, a high volume HIE going on because you're taking in patient information, even if it's in X12 or NCPDP format, you're taking in tons of patient information, you're managing a relationship with the customers, you're governing the information in terms of validation and context and source and control and authentication and all that stuff. You've already got that infrastructure in place. So our notion is rather than invest in new silos of infrastructure to solve specific business problems, look at the network exchange relationships you have with your providers right now. And then in a targeted way, augment that existing network with the components you need to interpret the data that's being coming from that lost tribe. It's, you know, you've already, you're already dealing with 11 tribes using an infrastructure. Why not just look at that infrastructure and say, you know what, if I add this, this, and this component, create this extensible clinical repository to, to house those transactions so that are HL7 or FHIR or whatever, 
and then I correlate those with the existing infrastructure, I've united the tribes. I've pulled everything back together without having to invent a whole new infrastructure. So this idea of ingestion, validation, correlation, and intervention, you're already doing it. You're already doing it with your existing network. And our thought is take a look at the pieces you've already got on the table, leverage those, extend those, and then be able to build, that, build out that clinical data strategy that, that you're all asking for and that we're hearing from you. So with that, next slide. So just, you know, kind of as a summary, the things we're suggesting that you should be looking at is, you know, think about an enterprise solution for exchanging a new tribe of information with your network, leveraging the components you have in place. You know, make sure that you're capable of, of managing multiple channels with that, that enterprise solution. You know, look for standards-based information exchange everywhere. If you think about the high volume exchange of information, whatever you're doing with anybody, employer groups, you know, providers, customers, whatever, it's wherever you're really successful in digital connectivity, it's based on standards. It's not based on proprietary Excel spreadsheets and CSV formats. And then have a really good capability to manage the in and outs of the data, the supply chain logistics. Because there's more fuzziness, you know, the, every X12 transaction is really a data model. You know, everybody knows what a referring provider is, what a rendering provider is, what a billing provider is. They know what, what the patient address is, you know, the, 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 the subscriber address versus the patient's address. Those are all well understood concepts in the X12 world. They're not well understood in the HL7 and the fire world right now. We're still working with them until we've got lots of history, you know, three, four, five years of history with managing that information. We won't as a community come to uh, a common understanding of what each of those data elements means and how we each interpret them and how they were acquired in the first place from, you know, ex epic system at Dr. Jones. And then I think, you know, we're going to see compliance and auditing become a bigger and bigger issue. One of the things that when we're looking at even just simple attachments, there's a lot of cases where payers are asking for more information maybe than they need. And a lot of times, even if they're asking for a small amount of information, the difficulty in providers, you know, there's plenty of places where providers, if they're working on PDFs and they get a request for additional information, they send a chart. You know, they send the whole thing because it takes so much time to go through an entire patient record and pull out exactly what the payer needs that when they send it in, you know, the once we go to a digital world where all that's moving electronically, I can guarantee you that the whole notion of minimal necessary information is going to start to raise its ugly head. So having a really good ability to think about what you're asking for and what you're getting and govern that and make sure that you know who sent it, why they sent it, when they sent it, how you asked for it, all of those, those, those components, you know, two, three years from now uh, are going to be very important to you uh, when this issue starts raising its ugly head. So with that, I think, you know, we hope that this has been of some value to you. Um, and uh, we hope that you see that uh, this, uh, you know, cute little uh, metaphor uh, is really about bringing together something that we separated from long ago when we started having a third party and that now we're being challenged by that discrepancy. And, and the goal is to try to unite and get a full picture of the patient. So with that, I'll turn over. Any questions? Thank you so much, John and Sergio. That was a great webinar. I want to encourage our participants, if you have any questions, please enter them into the questions field and hit enter. Um, we already have a few from the presentation, so we'll get started with those. What's the difference between the current clinical data standards and the newer FHIR standard? Um, Sergio, I can, I yeah, I yeah, can take that uh, question. Um, so traditionally, I would say, Conceptually, uh, they are more like traditional, uh, they are transaction based. So it's more of a exchanging notifications or transactions. While FHIR is more on a need or more interactive, I would say, is getting, instead of a payer or provider pushing the data to the payer, provider, a payer can just ask for specific elements of that data. So it's where way more, uh, I would say, I wouldn't say narrow, but more focused or specific way of getting the information. And that kind of uh, gets back to what John was saying, that uh, ability to get only what's needed, where needed, um, 
because of the HIP and privacy and so on, all these laws, it's, that's what it's all important. But also because of the ability to be more proactive, more um, um, quick uh, way of getting the information where the payer needs it. Thanks, Sergio. All right, our next question. Are there payer-specific use cases out there being designed by an industry group and used in production? Uh, sure, I'll take that. Um, yeah, interesting, that's a good question. There's there's a group called the Da Vinci Group, which if any of you haven't heard of it, it's probably something um, worth working on um, or worth investigating. Um, you probably, and many of you have heard of, you know, the Argonauts or the HL7 fire community and largely coming out of the congressional inquiries into data blocking and, you know, some of the stories that, that were, came out about the HIEs. Um, those, those initiatives uh, took off, um, but they still focus more on provider to provider interactions. Um, I, what I think with the emergence of EBR and the desire of payers to get, um, um, you know, more involved in the clinical data exchange game, the use cases around things like quality reporting, uh, EHR exchange, um, you know, just co benefits coverage. The idea that, you know, a provider needs to know at the point of service whether they need an authorization for, you know, simple stuff like that. Those specific use cases have kind of fallen to the back burner uh, with delays and standards, you know, new mandates and operating rules and whatnot. So those are emerging. And so the group, the Da Vinci group, which is kind of a, Another subgroup under HL7 um, has come together. A lot of the major payers, providers in the country, some of the vendors were a member, um, have come together to try to work on those specific payer provider use cases uh, around value-based care. It's an open community like the other HL7 groups. I would encourage anyone here to, you know, go on the HL7 website, look up DaVinci, and, and see if it's something that you're interested in, 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 in working with. Thanks, John. Another question. How does HIPAA consumer consent play into this? Um, so most of what we discussed today, we're still under treatment payment and operations. Um, now, some of that is an extension that's based on the provider contract. So if they're taking risk and the provider agrees to share specific information about uh, in order to get paid, then you're still under treatment payment operations. I think that, as I kind of alluded to, though, if you want to if you want to keep leveraging that TPO exemption under HIPAA, so that uh, you don't have to worry about that, uh, then you better start being much more clear. If you think about even just the emerging uh, attachment standards uh, and the use of link codes, being able to know exactly what you want, sending that proper link code to the provider to service the need and having the provider be able to interpret the link code and send you back exactly what you asked for, that's going to be important. As we go forward, you know, with the with a lot of a lot of also EMRs, HIEs, whatever are going to an opt-in rather than or opt out rather than opt-in, that's also going to start to raise some problems. You know, the volume of clinical information being shared in HIEs was not going up very quickly until suddenly lots of states and lots of vendors started moving and providers going to opt out as opposed to opt in. And there's probably a lot of state legislatures that are still going to still behind. They haven't caught up with that that trend in the industry. But the amount of information being shared under Commonwealth and Direct Trust and some of these other initiatives has skyrocketed now that patients actually have to actively now have to actively opt out. So I think this bears discussion, it bears watching, it bears, you know, involving your legal departments and compliance departments at the appropriate time. But as long as you stay true and aligned with your contracts, with your network, uh, and as long as the providers are doing what they're supposed to be doing already under HIPAA, um, the things we've discussed today, um, sh you should be on, on solid ice. And I want to add to what John was said that as as you're solutioning the system, and I, we, I already noticed that as I was talking to some pair customers, uh, they also think about um, a module called like constant management, being able to really, as you, as John was saying, as you get that data and you store it in um, one store, the raw original data, you should be able to trace back also not only what was stored, where it came from, but what was the constant related to that data, so that you know 
where the data can be or cannot be disseminated or what can be done or cannot be done with that data. So, in, uh, well, I guess we're at one o'clock, Sam. Yep, thank you very much, John and Sergio, for this fantastic webinar. Again, I will be sending the slide deck along with the link to the recorded webinar to all of our registrants. So thank you very much for participating, and I hope everybody has a, a great weekend. Thanks very much, everybody.